Now, I want to let you know that I'm looking around the audience right now, and I'm seeing lots of faces. I see Dan, City Archivist, is here. I see Bill Ashwell, who I used to work with at The Reporter. I see Jill Summerhays, who I used to work with at The Reporter. I see Janice, and I see Clyde out there, who I helped move to town when he came to hear from St. Thomas to work at The Reporter back in 1987. Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to see faces. I see Bob Burt. I used to work with at the record. And Bob, did you ever work at the reporter? Well, that's why you're still smiling. It's okay. That's cool. No, it, this is uh, this has been a long time thoughts in my mind about the 20th anniversary. And I find it kind of weird today because this would have been the place some 30 years ago this time of night on a Tuesday, I probably would have been having a couple of beers in the time club with one of the reporters from the from the um, reporter over here. That's what this place was at the time. And it's kind of weird that tonight I couldn't park anywhere but in front of the reporter, the only parking spaces that were there, except the reporter building isn't there anymore. It was replaced with low income housing, which always struck me as somewhat strange. But tonight, I'm hoping to get some memories from people who are here and some questions from people who are online and some discussion about the future of journalism. Uh, this last few days has been pretty lousy. Um, but I wanted to, first off, before I even get into the lousy stuff, I wanted to mention about the old Cambridge reporter. This is the evening reporter from before amalgamation of Cambridge. So this is a photo from a promotional newspaper they put out in the 60s. And essentially they were promoting the newspaper, trying to get people to want to work there. And this is part of the old front that faced onto Ainsley Street. Newland's factory was across the street. And I still, I have some more memories of the place. It taught me how to tell stories fast. And I never met deadlines along the way. So uh, that's sort of how it goes. But there was also the thing that news often would come to us. Um, I missed that. Uh, that was in my first month at The Reporter in 1986. I was a Conestoga College journalism student working a, uh, I guess a work term, they call it at the time. We were putting out the progress edition essentially this big thing full of fluffy, happy business stories that was intended to bring in extra revenue in the first quarter of the year. And any Thompson newspaper reporter will remember the joys of progress and working with the ad department who always had a good idea for a new story. Right, Clyde? Yes, he's smiling with wisdom there. But um, I came into the office that morning after this had happened, I looked down, the front window was all caved and the bus wasn't there. And I said, what happened? A bus drove in the front of the building. And I was like, and they said, nobody really was that excited. Everything always weird happened at the reporter. And if you look at that picture above where the, the front of the bus is, that's the front of the newsroom up there. We were upstairs. And I remember how nobody wanted to have a desk just inside the front door of the newsroom. And... <laughs> because that was where everybody would come in all day long. People would come in to complain with a news story. I got a photo idea for you, complained about a story, church bulletin, somebody getting married, complained about a story. I've got a potato that looks like Richard Nixon's head. And it did too. I took a little, I took the picture and I think I put the story in the paper about it. There was also the sunflower that grew up two stories high to somebody's upstairs window. We took all that stuff all the time. And I miss that connection with community. People came to us because they trusted us or we didn't have another alternative. I'm not sure. But it was it was kind of cool to have people watching over us that carefully. And people would share information. And I was also corrected by people who would walk in and say, that's Concession Road, not Concession 
Church Street. It took me about a year to learn that from somebody coming into town. Um, and there was also the day that I misnamed the Speed River in Preston in a story. It took a while to live that one down. The Grand isn't in Preston. It was made abundantly clear to me. But we're here tonight to talk about Cambridge Reporter. 20 years ago today, it was a Friday, um, and it happened to be my wedding anniversary as well. It was kind of weird. The last paper, and it was about, Dave, you contributed to it. It was a good 60 pages. It was a great big fat thing, as I remember right. Everybody wanted to have something in that last reporter. And I know there was angst in the community about it, um, but the angst didn't last that long. Shh. Tonight, I've got competition for what we're going to talk about. I hoped this wouldn't be the competition tonight. So I stripped a whole bunch of slides out of this thing tonight. We're going to be talking about other stuff, I hope, tonight about journalism. But in the last five days, there's been the Metroland bankruptcy which means they're stopping printing of Cambridge Times and 69 other community papers across the province. They're going to move online, I think, but it's still in bankruptcy. So I'm not sure exactly how it's going to spin out. And at last count, I heard that 68 journalists are losing their jobs and all the machinations and changes around. And then I realized that there was also Metro Media in Quebec. Um, they're now in bankruptcy or, or heading to it. They're closing 30 publications there. I think that started back in August, but now the bankruptcy start is, stuff is happening now. And I also heard that a independent weekly in Glengarry, Eastern Ontario, closed last Thursday at the same time as Metroline closing. It took me three or four days to find that news buried into everything else. Um, this pains me greatly. Um, it's great fun to be a journalist in a community, even when people sometimes chew at you for doing things wrong. But I never, ever had anybody run up to me and scream fake news at me like reporters get now. Um, so it is a different time now. So tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the reporter. And I'm hoping that people who have memories as well of something I mentioned, I'm, I'm not talking in great detail. But if you have something, put your hand up and share. Hey, I remember this. Or why did that happen? What do I remember about it? That's perfectly fair. And since I do have Dave Maneri here, and Clyde here, and Jill here, and Bill here, and who else have we got? Any other? No staffers here. I don't know how many staffers. I don't see who's online. But what I would hope is that you get to share a couple of thoughts as well and talk a little bit about where all the Cambridge reporter history re resides today. And it's all, all the stuff was saved. But I'm trying to, I'll be as gentle as I can, Dan, when I talk about it, because we're, we both share frustration about it. And I'll ask the question, what's next for local news? I don't have an answer. I don't know, but PowerPoints continue. Galt Reporter, founded November 13th, a Friday the 13th in 1846 uh, by Peter Jaffrey in partnership with James Ainsley. And I always get the Ainsleys mixed up. Dan, James was son? No, I forget the connection to the founders in Galt. I've never gotten that straight in... 35 years being here. Okay, that's cool. You can take a pass. It's okay, Dan. Just because you're in the front seat, it's okay. Um, however, the reporter was not the first local paper. The first one was in 1844, a weekly in Waterloo, or sorry, in Preston, the first newspaper, I think, in Waterloo County. And it was in German because there was a big German presence in Preston. And it eventually closed and the press moved to Waterloo to became another, to be producing another German language weekly in Waterloo as well. And to put it in context, Preston Times was, was fairly 
young in comparison, October 28th, 1948, when it was, it was founded, and the Hespler Herald, 1897. And they come together to become the Preston Times Herald in 1970. And then that became the Cambridge Times. So that's kind of the context around where the reporter is. Early years, I think late 1800s to 1951, Water Street, that building is still there. It has a pretty front on it now, different facade. I think there's a pharmacy in it, but that's where the paper was produced. The press was in that building as well. And as I understand, if I believe Bob Green's stories about it, there was also a pile of empty liquor bottles in the Grand River outside the window because they would keep throwing them out the back. Um, Bob Green, who I had the pleasure of reading his columns at The Reporter, he had such a huge following. And he worked in The Reporter in the 50s and 60s. And some of the stories he tells about it are crazy, but I can believe it based on some of the other stories I've heard around the way as well. Um, the Reporter was downtown in a stuffy little Scottish town of Galt. And this was also on that building, before I go on, they did a little bit of that social media stuff before it was cool. This is VE Day, and they would write updates, essentially tweets, and put them in the window on paper. People would come down to the reporter to get the latest news before the edition would actually come out. Um, when I see this photo, it is... Um, I still am kind of gobsmacked when I look at it, because that was it. And that was also at the time when Galt would have been around maybe twelve to 15,000 people. Dan, is that about right? World War II? Wouldn't have been much more than that, right? Yeah, yeah, around maybe about 20,000. And the circulation of the reporter would have been, I think, around 8,000 to 9,000 at the time. So it was hitting probably every other household in town, um, at least although some of those households would be much larger than today, so maybe it was higher than that. Uh, but they had the local news. 1944, before VE Day, Thompson Newspapers, Lord Thompson of Fleet came to town and bought The Reporter, Woodstock Sentinel Review, Sarnia Observer, and I think the paper in Welland at the time, because... At the time, the reporter was part of one of the first newspaper chains in the country. It was actually four papers, four daily papers that were working together. And Alan Holmes, who was the publisher of the reporter at the time, was also the group publisher for it. So in some ways, the reporter itself was ahead of the game, even though owned by a local syndicate of business people. And Thompson came in in 44. He came south from Timmins after buying the Timmins Daily Press. And he bought up this group and continued on having a connection to the reporter because his son Ken was sent here in 49, 50, 51 to learn the ropes of advertising and business management under the, under the tutelage, I guess, of Alan Holmes. And there's another woman whose name escapes me at the moment, who was the business manager at the reporter at the time, and she eventually moved up to second in command at Thompson Newspapers. Margaret Hamilton. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I was drawing a blank on that. And that astounds me as well. But there's a lot of Thompson that came out of the reporter to move on into that world of um, Lord Thompson of Fleet buying up anything that had a printing press, apparently. I found this when I was digging around in the archives. This is 1955. This is page 22 of a Saturday reporter. You go from, look at the detail that's in that police story up there. He's convicted. He's convicted. Full name, what happened, tried to ditch the car at the, uh, the scrapyard, everything else. And cool. And then it's right over top of a story about a baby owl coming into somebody's living room through a chimney. And then there's a, a report on the market 
the farmer's market and it talks about the price of potatoes and celery, cauliflower and things like that. And then there's a public utilities commission report there slamming or hiring a consultant to stop unionization. Anything. And that's all on one little corner of one page. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the rest of the paper was pretty full with ads because that was Thompson style. And Jill is smiling there. You are smiling. What do you remember, Jill? Did you write some of those? Do you offer stuff when you were there and classified, right? You were classified manager. Oh, I've never asked you for some of the dirt if you were a manager. You would have heard some of the good stuff. Oh, that's Jill. You're always like that. You know, Jill is a neighbor of mine in West Galt. It's great fun. I, I'm so pleased to see her here today. In 1964, the reporter was, I think, desperate for workers. And there was, I see several photos that were taken from this job fair industrial event over at the armories right across the street from the reporter. And they were pushing really hard to get people to come into journalism, into printing trades, all of these things. And the another paper, another Thompson paper, the Woodstock Sentinel Review was there as well, advertising for people. It's like, really? But then again, they were a sister paper, so that, that would have made perfect sense. But what I notice up there was how the reporter was playing to local politics a little bit as well. By the 1950s, it had transformed. It originally was Galt Reporter, then it became, I think at one point, the reporter, then the evening reporter, then the Galt evening reporter. And by the 60s, it was back to the evening reporter, but with additions for Galt, Preston, and Hespler. And there is also in Preston at 118 Westminster North, there is still the reporter bureau that was there. Uh, it closed in the late 1980s, I believe, but the building still stands. And that building had a staff of upwards of 20 people at one point, as I remember, in the 50s and 60s. And about a third of the circulation for the reporter was in Preston. Um, it was really pushing into that space that I would have expected the record to be having circulation in. And there was also a bureau in rented space on the main street, Queen Street in Hespler. So if you look through papers at the time, you would see pages that are flagged the Preston Reporter or the Hespler Reporter. And you would not you would not see, I don't recall seeing the Galt Reporter. It was always trying to differentiate inside. So they're playing to this, they were trying to keep everybody together enough to buy it to sell advertising, but far enough apart to keep them kind of upset about some news, I think. Um, I think they were stirring them up a little bit. Ah, yes. I've variously, I learned very quickly at the reporter that the reporter was not always known by the reporter. Um, in town, it was the distorter, uh, the galt rag. Were there any other ones that I haven't heard along the way that we can say in mixed company? No? Okay. Um, this, I, this astounds me. There's in the archives at the city, there are a couple of fake newspapers that staff put out. This one's from 1958, and it's in, it's before their uh, annual staff party, uh, the, usually the end of February. And at the time, apparently, the reporter paid for most of the cost of it, dinner, dancing, booze. And I chopped off the bottom of this because... There is a rather somewhat clothed, attractive woman there with comments about, uh, oh, look who's new in circulation. And then at the bottom of the page, there's one, what they say in the women's room. And I'm going, very different times than now. And what I can't get over is the headline, hey, slaves, Ken says our rag is the best of them all. I can't believe nobody got fired for that. But this is actually tame compared to some of the other 
um, slagging of the Thompson and reporter management inside this that was printed at the reporter. Um, I do not pretend to understand the environment that was in there. If that was the dynamic, you could get away with that. I don't know. Um, but the game here was that Thompson was looking to expand to the moon. That was the, the running gag through it. And they had one of their local staff members who was going to be the local circulation manager, I think, because they wanted to get him kicked out to the moon. That was the inference that I got. Uh, but this kind of stuff um, continued on to, into the early 60s. And it was like, okay. When I look back at the reporter, it was your grandparents' Facebook. I can remember as a reporter beating myself into the ground, being sent out for photo after photo after photo after photo after photo of things. Um, who remembers how the reporter used to have wall-to-wall -wall coverage of every high school graduation? Anybody who was in the office breathing and could hold a camera was sent out to get pictures of the graduates and the valedictorian and write a speech about it on that Friday night because they were always on the same night except for St. Benedict which was the week following. So you always tried to take your holidays in the week of all of the other commencement activities because you had to have it in and done by 10 o'clock at night. Clyde, do you remember doing that, right? Going out to them? Just a few terrible nights, Clyde. <laughs> Oh, the fairs? Oh, yes. There was nothing like Cambridge Fall Fair weekend. Working a weekend, getting half a day off, or working two days. That's the way it goes. And oh, yeah, I never went on a Canamera game, but I, many people did. Sports usually did on that. Trading back and forth, um, riding in the in the bus with all the players and having enough copy when they came back to fill four or five pages in a broadsheet newspaper of all the happiest sports news you could possibly get of kids hugging one another. And it was, it was the time the reporter lived on that. That, that was the business model, happy faces, people in there and, and don't offend advertisers. What I also found fascinating about the reporter was how it was an instigator and a champion and really it played right in the middle of all of the local politics all the time. And I make, I note the, the difference now with the talk about amalgamation. This is Cambridge's 50th birthday, but there's the threat of the province coming in and wiping it out. Same thing that happened there. But I remember going back and looking at some of those clippings, clippings I used to see at the report of the files we had on them. It was three and four stories a day for months and months and months. And after amalgamation, it was still a, a gold mine for news. I can remember talking with uh, Claudette Miller, first mayor of Cambridge. And she knew exactly how to play the politics and get the reporter on side because she would go to sit at regional council beside Mayor Morty Rosenberg, I believe it was. She was sitting beside him. And Kitchener desperately wanted all of the land around where Toyota is now, trying to stir it up. And whenever things were starting to come apart in Cambridge, people were fighting amongst one another. But that would tell me she would give an elbow to the Kitchener mayor and say, hey, so what are you doing about trying to get that industrial land? <laughs> He'd promptly stand up and say something stupid, front page of the reporter. Everybody in town came back together to put a hate on for Kitchener. And also I could see Claudette doing that because she was a very astute politician. And I see Ray at the back who's nodding with wisdom about Claudette. Good to see you, my friend. Yes. Ray, I'll ask you, you were, you never worked at the reporter, right? No, you're always the other guy. You were the other guys. You kept getting stories that annoyed my manager so much at the reporter. It was great. What's your, um, uh, could you grab a, bring a mic over to Ray just for a second? I'm curious, Ray, 
what is your recollection of being in what would be as close to a newspaper war as we would ever get in town? Because I can remember when I first came to town, our managers were always sweating over what the Wednesday Times would say and have as a story. What's your recollection? Well, um, to be honest with you, we were just there to try and beat you guys at every turn. Yeah. And you were doing the same to us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it was, yeah, it was friendly competition. Mm -hmm. Yet we were, we were dead serious about it. And yes, we pushed the record off to the side as often as we could. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, um, but I do remember in the office, they did not like Wednesdays in the office because they, that's when the times came in and they always took it into a room and closed the door. I remember that vividly and they came out grumpy. And what happened when we went to three times a week? By that time, I don't think anybody really was paying as much attention as they should. That's just my observation from the trenches along the way. Um, I think I was too busy trying to do three jobs at a time by that point. Because you went three times a week, uh, mid-90s? No, later, later than that. Um, I would say it was probably Bob's over here too, Bob Burt. Yes, uh, Bob's a better memory than I have. Bob's got a great memory on this. We, we went to twice a week, and you went off for the record at that point in time, Bob. 84. 84. So 84. that's when we went twice a week, and then we went to three times... 80, we were around 88, the same time as Toyota. Cool. Yeah, Toyota. I came to town when Toyota arrived, and it was like amazing stuff. But Cambridge reporter had always photos like this. This is from the Preston Bureau. I found this photo and loved it. It's one you got to make sure it gets digitized, Dan, just to keep people angry. Um, or not. Or maybe it's going to be welcome to... Berlin town or something if they rename everything I don't know I'm going to get myself in trouble here but that the way that the news played in the middle of that the grind of it there were times when it was there was just stories that kept going and I don't see that anymore in local news there's no next day story it's sort of something comes up and then disappears and pops up over here two months later or something and I remember how if I ever said that I didn't have another story to work on, I'd probably get a smack up the side of the head. So I've developed this file. of I had stories. I could update any story. I had file folders. Ray would probably do the same thing. You never had something not to do. There was always something to update along the way. I remember that so vividly. And I've still got one great big banker box full of clippings of stuff that I still never got to from 20, 25 years years ago that I just kept saving and just kept saving and just kept saving because there was always something to talk about. Not like today where people think there's nothing going on, but there really is. So final years, and I'm glad Marie Sutherland isn't here because she come up and kicked me in the shin for doing that. That was when the reporter went online in 1999. I can't believe that, but we did. 1995. Thompson sells the reporter to Hollinger. And I discovered that Hollinger was perhaps even slightly more penny pinching than Thompson was along the way. Clyde's eyes just rolled. Um, it was an interesting, an interesting time um, with Conrad Black as our um, leader. I'll just say that. Uh, and then Sun Media in 1998, they bought us in a package with the, the record and a whole cluster of other papers. And then in 1999, Torstar bought the reporter and record and spectator, and I forget what else, in another package. And so I think I was owned, Clyde and I would both have been owned by every major newspaper company at the time in the country. Yeah, and it was all weird corporate machinations of things along the way. So I never could figure out why I didn't get eight different paychecks at all that different times to, as a good multiplier along the way. 2002, um, we were getting squeezed pretty hard. And I remember by that point, I was in management at the reporter and city editor. And 
Then in 2002, the contraction to two times a week, and we gave it a really good run. I was managing editor at the time. And I would say that I had great fun at that point because I had letters to the editor everywhere. I would not put news in the paper if I could have three more pages of letter to the editor. And Gord, Gord Paul, who was the editor I had working, he would come in an extra day early and lay out all the pages inside with all letters to the editor. And maybe then we'd have one or two pages of news, but they just kept coming on. So it, that feeling of Facebook before Facebook was a thing, people wanted us something to say, except we would always say, that's not true. Yes, it is. Prove it. We would curate what we put in the paper. We don't have that today. Yeah, I had hair back then. I really did. I learned a lot at the reporter. I learned how to function with sometimes lacking sleep. I learned how to go to a city council meeting that went on till midnight and then write for six hours and fill most of the next day's local news section and go home as the sun was rising and walk home. That was part of the time when I was first covering city council. We had wall-to-wall -wall coverage of stuff. We beat our brains out to try and get that done. Um, I also remember being at local things that were, I guess, news to call them and a lack of anything else. I was down at Park Hill Dam when um, within 10 minutes, I think, of the first call to the fire department when the uh, when he went into the water and drowned. And I was there when Dave Nicholson went in the water to look for the body in the dark and his flashlight disappeared under the dam. And I was on the rescue line afterwards. They called for people to come down and help pull him out. And the line broke in our hands. So I have that memory of being beside people in town doing things. And I have that memory of how people came to an event. And I don't know if that is still here anymore. And I'm curious, I, I'm wondering, for the audience here, what do you remember about the reporter? What's, what's your strongest memory of the reporter? Scott. Well, thank, thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate that very much. Ah, Jill? Jill, you like a microphone. It's okay. Thank you. I, what I remember was when you were talking about how things have changed because there was a picture of the woman on the bottom of the page. Mm -hmm. When I came to the reporter, my staff were not told that a woman had taken over the job from a man. And my then boss, who should be nameless, said, we have a new classified manager starting on Monday. The name is Jay Summerhays. Okay. So Jay Summerhays comes in on the Monday, having worked previously for the Globe and Mail, where we had an art department and we had all kinds of things. You'd go in and you'd say, I'd like you to do this, that, and the other. Instead of a clip book. I spent two days looking for the art department, but anyway. <laughs> um, so I came in and they said, well, who are you? And I said, I'm Jay Summerhays. And they were absolutely appalled. There was no desk, there was no phone. They just hadn't quite got ready. But within a week, one of the realtors came in to put their ads in and he said, um, I have to speak to the classified manager. And I said, yep, you're speaking to her. No, 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 I have to speak to a man. I said, well, the, I, I want to discuss my accounts. I cannot discuss that with you. I said, well, then good luck. You won't find anybody that knows any more than I do, but um, try and find somebody. So he went up to the publisher and said, I do not wish to speak to a woman about my accounts. It's personal information. And he said, well, then nobody's going to discuss it with you. So things have definitely changed. Who was the publisher at the time, Joe? Don Hamilton. Don Hamilton, Don Hamilton. yes. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Clyde, yeah. I'm going to ask you, what's your memory? What do you think? Take a mic. Take a mic, man. When I uh, came to the reporter in 88, mm -hmm. 
we were in the, we were involved in a uh, controversy with the hospital, and the, the, the hospital controversy seems to have been the, the history of the report. Yeah, which one? Yeah. Which one? Yeah, I know, it's just one after another. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the time, the uh, uh, the government was trying to get remove the uh, hospital administrator because he was head of the uh, hospital association, and he was advising other hospitals uh, to deficit, uh, you know, plan deficits. And uh, the province was saying, you can't plan deficits; you have to balance your budgets and um, I, I had a friend that actually worked for one of the uh, health, local health uh, units, and uh, he, he heard the assistant deputy minister say, I want the head of Don Robertson on a platter. Yeah. And we, we carried Don up Robertson. this campaign to save the, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the job of uh, the local hospital, and, and it worked. Yeah. We had, that was with the the clippings. We had the Save Our Hospital thing on the yeah, front okay. page. Yeah, we were, yeah. Uh, we were, we were, we were we were handing bags of mail in at Queens Park yeah. uh, to save our hospital, and uh, it worked. And then Helen Wright took over, and another controversy started. It, it, the hospital was so, and you know, and I, I feel like we're amazed. We've got a hospital in town because of the reporter, and I, I, I always think yeah. of the reporter every time I pass that building. Yeah. And Clyde, I would ask you to think about what were the last stories you worked on at the reporter before it closed in 2003. You were working on. I know it had something to do with high school closures. the high school closures and the hospital. It might have been the tail end of the the Helen Wright and suing everybody back and forth in that place. The story that I never finished was, uh, you know, the paper closed before I got to to uh, reveal Helen Wright's uh, golden parachute, the hand oh. there, and that that uh, it really bothers me that that's never come out. Oh, it's sort of come out now. That's okay. Breaking news: Idea Exchange. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Clyde. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sure, absolutely. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know the format for tonight, and I have a couple of binders here of pictures oh, I've taken wow. from the reporter, and some of them go back late fifties. Uh, I think one or two I've got from the 40s here. You you must believe me when I say Dan's eyes just went pop. He's the city archivist right here. Yeah. You two are going to talk. Oh, um, sounds good to me. And I'd love to have a chance to look through that. Would you mind after we're done, we'll just, we'll gather around and we'll look through some stuff. Is that okay with you? Basically, that's why I came. Well, excellent. And sorry, and what's your first name? Bill. Bill. Um. So Bill, what do you have stashed away in there? Just give me a little summary. I'm I'm intrigued. I see two big fat binders there right I now do, in your lap. Like I say, some of them are overlapping. Some of them, mm -hmm. like I say, are from the 50s. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I've been doing this for uh, quite a period of time. Okay, so what's your strongest memory of the reporter aside from two fat binders on your lap? I say partially the story uh, where they did the picture uh, of Ray Shuttleworth standing on the corner of okay. Ainsley and Dixon Street mm -hmm. in the middle of the flood in 74. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that was uh, I think that was a spectator photo originally. Was it? Yeah. A spectator yeah. photo. But what's also interesting, and this pains me as well, was the flood damaged the reporter building. The water came up that far. So as part of the cleanup of that building, the story that I was told was that from the beginning when I was there, they lost all the old images and negatives from the flood because of the flood. The other story I've heard is that during the cleanup later on, the contractors who were who came in saw stacks of stacks of boxes that were saved of old photos and negatives and threw them out. And there was a lawsuit afterwards. That's exactly how I felt when I heard that as well. And I think Dan is cringing up here as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's hard to find a safe place to keep information and papers. Um, looking at myself on that, I, I had hair, man, that's terrible. Anyways, this moves right over. This, this is Dan took me into the bowels of the city archives. When the reporter closed, I was the last person out of the building, last reporter staff member. And I spent my last two weeks there going through the old building everywhere I could to find anything that was of value. I was going through the filing cabinets in the publisher's office, pulling stuff out. Um, and so there's some boxes full of old VHS Thompson training tapes that, that Dan looks at and goes, what's that? Um, I was finding 
clippings, photos, pulling papers out of the, the morgue where we stored papers. And I was trying to go everywhere in the building. There was stuff stuck away in little crannies and everything else. And that all was cataloged by um, the archivist, or sorry, the librarian at the record. She was sent down to essentially catalog it all. There's a manifest of about four pages long of all the things that were saved. And they were put in boxes. They were taken over to the archives and they are safely stored in the archives and they're safely stored in the archives. And there's been no funding for Dan, as I understand it, to do anything with them, to really give them an ease of access to the public. Um, Dan, you'll let people examine them. There's no problem with that, right? Yeah. But it's, I see Dan is looking quite uncomfortable here as I'm venturing into this space and this is not meant to slam Dan at all. Um, did you want to say anything at this point or do you want to let it slide past? Not get a microphone on this boy. Get up here, Shannon. No, because this is, I suspect there are people who want to access the reporter information. You've probably had questions about it. Yeah, so like when we were looking at the stuff, like you said, we have like a, a general index of what's there but we were finding stuff in there when you and i were looking at it yeah. we were like it's a dream project for me to have it like all digitized and that like i started as a student in the archives 11 years ago and that's what i did um i got a lot of projects like that i'd love to be able to do uh, mm -hmm. and all that. so hopefully eventually we'll get the resources to do that so we, we have uh boxes and boxes we have like a thousand rolls of microfilm newspapers on there um not a complete collection. Um, whatever we got uh, from the reporter, uh, there are gaps in that. We do have a lot of the physical papers. Uh, anyone's interested in looking at that? But uh, yeah, they're they're there. They're being preserved. Um, the dream project is to eventually to digitize the files and maybe even the microfilm someday, mm -hmm. and that just to make it more accessible to the public and that because there's just a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, like the fun story we did is we actually in a what was it a folder labeled unidentified people we found a photo of mayor leggett and her husband and we showed it to her that night and that was from 30 years ago in 1993 so. i think yeah, they were really in front cool. of the rare the uh, now the rare building but it was yeah. uh, lambs Inn back then the headquarters for garden gate i think their company back then yeah. and then we found a picture of the old queen square arena as yeah. well that i'd really never seen a picture of so Mm -hmm. Yeah, if anyone's interested in coming to take a look at the reporter archives, they are at the archives, and uh, you can definitely uh, reach out to me or Kevin to get a hold of me or or whatever. I'd love to share it. Yeah, it's great fun. No, it's it's for me. It was a blast from the past just to wander and dig around in there, but it is it's really like archives in the wild in there, and that's what I find a little bit um, sad because I'm sure lots of people would really be curious about what kind of stuff is in there, and there are, I think, hundreds of just photos there from the seven, late 70s. They're just bagged up every monthly photo. And like I showed that photo a moment ago about the uh, stuff like that. That's nothing. That's part of only one manila envelope that I stumbled across and just spread them out. There are photos and photos and photos and photos. Most of them don't have names on the back, which is wild. Because I remember how we used to at the reporter we save them by negatives by date. And you have a little strip of three negatives. You put a little notch out on the photo that was used. You printed it. You put it in a little half a manila envelope thing in a card catalog thing. And you would, that's if somebody wanted a photo, they looked it up in the paper on the date, said, this is the picture we need. The photographer went and pulled through all the negatives, found the right one, printed it out. So you would have to key it back to the reporter of that date. Now, it's there was not a, it's not like you would archive it or organize it now by subject. You'd have to make the connection afterwards, which would be really labor intensive, but boy, it would be fun. It would really be fun. I keep finding my own story, old stories in there as well. Now, right now it is 746. We've got about 15 minutes left. And I wanted to hear your thoughts about this. What's the future of it? What are your thoughts about what's happened in the last week? Everything's online now in town. The only printed paper you're going to get is the record now, I think. 
And personally, I don't think that, that'll last in the new year very far because moving paper around tons of paper every day is extraordinarily expensive. Dave, our resident historian, right behind the resident archivist. You've been here a long time. You used to work at the reporter with me. Yes. And then you went over yes. to the Times. Yes, that's right. And so you've seen all of this. What do you think? You well, go back I, over I've got so many thoughts that I, I I really don't know where to begin. It would, but I, I yeah, I, I grew up here. So I, I I grew up delivering the reporter, uh, reading Carl Fletcher's uh, uh, columns mm -hmm. and uh, even Ann Landers, which was popular back then. I went, I'd sit on the porch after delivering them and and take a look at all the front page news and everything. And so it, it had a, a, you know, a real impact on me growing up, uh, not only delivering it, but reading it and, and reading the, the columns and the, the local news. And uh, so when Carl Fletcher, Don Moore was the editor yeah, uh, and, no. and, yeah. and Carl hired me, I think I was probably the last guy he hired because he retired when I was there. And um, the, the uh, so I felt I kept kind of blessed to, to work with him and and learn from him and um you know when you were talking about people coming in the news would come into the reporter <clears throat> that was so true wasn't it and i mean somebody caught a big fish in the grand river mm -hmm. and we would take a picture out usually out in front of the reporter building and and uh, mm -hmm. uh i remember going out and 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 exploring some sasquatch footprints in the snow Bob Hunter, I don't know if you remember Bob Hunter, but anyway, at the, and and myriad other things like that, and and uh, you know you might disparage uh, I, I, as as society evolved and as the the, the news business evolved, and uh, um, there, there might have been those who disparaged these this local news covering things like that, and certainly editors came in and said no more. No more commencement shots or or athlete of the year shots or the the, the standard shots that you would you would take. You have to make it interesting and and have some action in it or something. And but there's you know you and you look at the air news and I don't know if anybody is here from air, but um, you know it's it's got its detractors, but it's still going and it's serving its its the the people out there and it's doing it in a way that that I think resonates with, with, and you don't see it anymore. So as we're going digital and and everything's moving online um, and, and that's the way of the world, um, you know, you can't help but feeling. And then to hear what's happening with the Cambridge Times and the Chronicle and, and everything else, it, it's, you know, it's sad that uh, we're losing that, uh, that that way of, of presenting news and mm -hmm. and uh so i've got a lot of thoughts on on cool. the whole thing but cool um, excellent anyway it's uh you know it, it the, the reporter um you were talking about some of the memories and clyde i you know you, you would have so many as you you do and every jail everybody else um but um you know the the, the reporter had a the, the biggest scoop in in history in its history and it happened and it was in the late 1800s i think and it, and it was told by uh, james herbert cranston who grew up in galt delivered worked as a printer's devil and as a reporter and so jaffrey was a, a, a an old telegrapher and he could uh, so and the telegraph office was right beside uh, at the building you showed on water mm -hmm. street the telegraph office was right beside it the walls were very thin so if you sat in the, the the next room at the reporter you could hear if you knew how to read the the you, you could you could decipher the message and so there was a message a big heavyweight championship out from nevada uh, i don't know if it was gentleman john corbett or, or not john corbett uh, uh, john sullivan um and i mentioned john corbett of course and he just passed away and um but uh in any case he listened to the that it was supposed to be coming through to Toronto and on to Montreal, and it was going to be printed in the Globe and Mail. Well, the reporter eavesdropped. They printed an early edition. They had their their edition on the streets in Galt before the 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 Globe and Mail. It was the biggest scoop that they ever had. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, by larceny. I love it. 
So Dave, would you pass the microphone back to Rita there? Rita, who is a former police officer and a commander in Cambridge, who I've always enjoyed chatting with. What are your thoughts about the removal of journalism from the environment? I, it, I was so sad, yeah. saddened to, and it wasn't unexpected, sadly. I'm expecting mm -hmm. it because I love getting the record. I get the, like I get other print mm -hmm. sent, sent to my home. I just love reading the newspaper. I just enjoy that. Um, I've got a lot of memories about reporters as well, as you could. Probably. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. Um, and I'm always thinking, how do I deal with them at this crime scene without destroying things? You know, so it, but I mean, you knew and I did things like that. You know, you talked about the Dave Nicholson. Yeah. An absolutely yeah. brutal, brutal day. Yes. Brutal stretch of days down yeah. there. Yeah, it certainly was. Mm -hmm. And I, it's it's uh, it very vivid. It's yeah. still very vivid to me what yeah. happened. This, I mean, I was there as you were, you know, when yeah. the line broke. Yeah. But um, I enjoy the reporters. I know that there was a little bit of tension between the police and the media. And um, I, you know, I, I remember saying, like, remember the some of the management would get so upset, and I'd say, well, it keeps us honest. It keeps us on our toes. Like, why do we not want to have somebody? watching over like there's nothing wrong with that um it saves us from having a state that we really don't want to have mm -hmm. and that's run by mm -hmm. you know people you don't want them to be running it by so yeah. um i never had an issue with journalists um i, I you had your job to do mm -hmm. i had my job to do and, and you work as best as you can and there'd be tension there's no doubt about it there'd be that odd bit of tension but as far as the journalism, what I worry about is AI. Like I worry about the artificial yeah. intelligence. That's my fear right now is that, mm -hmm. am I reading things that's real? Has it been written by somebody who actually felt it and and, mm -hmm. and experienced it? I don't yeah. know, that's that's my concern. I don't know where it's going. It's just gonna continue going digital, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I do read digital. Um, I do, I'm online first thing in the morning before I take my dog for a walk early in the morning, I'm, I'm online looking at that. And then I wait for my, my um, um, hard, uh, hard copy to come in. And I love reading that in the evening. Mm -hmm. So, and it's sad, but yeah. I actually am surprised. I was just sitting here thinking, maybe he doesn't see that I'm here. Oh, I saw you oh, here. Yeah. I saw you here. Now, don't go away. Right okay. beside you is Cambridge's Santa Claus, Bill. I worked with Bill very early on at The Reporter. He was, you were never on full-time staff. You were always stringer part-time, right? Oh, I started out in the circulation. circulation. That's it. I'm sorry. I misplaced that. Yeah. So, so what are your memories? Your, yours memories should be as pretty well deep as mine or very close to it. Well, I didn't make the front page of the Cambridge Times until about 2015 and 2014. There's no justice, is there, Bill? No. There's no, no justice. And they wouldn't have recognized me anyways, not with the suit and the beard on and everything. But um, when I started out in the circulation department, I was in charge of carriers. You know, those were the kids. This was the afternoon paper at the time. And making the connection with the kids was great. You know, uh, from time to time, I'd go to the schools and do the recruiting. But a lot of times, it was just word of mouth. And can you go see, you know, my manager, uh, Martin Lattisar, go see this yeah. kid. He, his parents phoned in. He wants a paper. So I'd go and I'd sit down with him and all this. And these kids were so excited because in probably 99% of the cases, this was their first job, right? This was their chance to make, earn their money on their own. And I, with anything, sure, there were kids that probably shouldn't have known what a paper route was. Um, but a lot of them were really hard working at it and everything. And I think the what connected with me, what, what really resonated with me about that job was the connection with the community, meeting the vendors, going to, I had one point I had to go to all of the variety stores in, in West Gulf, mm -hmm. East Gulf mm -hmm. and Preston to collect the accounts and all this and just to sit there and, and to talk with you know um the richies at richie's market down on grand avenue um you know uh all the little variety stores that unfortunately are all homes now you know that are all gone but it was just a chance to connect with them you know and to hear 
what they wanted to see, what they were seeing and what they were experiencing in the community. And then when I, later on, when I was working for you, doing the... Uh, that was a rather strong point at me, I saw. No, it's, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, it was, I was doing the community news for East Gulp, West Gulp, and uh, maybe it was just those two. And, but just seeing, connecting with the schools, what's going on in the schools and what's happening with, you know, with the, uh, the service groups on it. And it was just, it was so great to have, for lack of a better term, your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the community. Mm -hmm. And I really, I really enjoyed that and I missed that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Bill, hand it back to our resident police officer for a second and pass it all the way over here to Paul. Oh, you, you have a connection. I remember talking to you about that because your dad yeah. brought you to town and it's the reporter. Yes, that's right. Um, my father was Ray D'Souza and uh, he was the business financial editor from, I'm guessing now because I was just a kid, but I think from 68 until 77, for about nine years. And uh, you talk about the archives and so on with Dan, and I couldn't help but smile myself because when I was 16 and waiting for a ride home to Christopher Drive, where we lived at the time, uh, my I think my dad got off work at five-ish or so. And uh, if I was there at four, he would say, going to the morgue because I'd be upstairs where the reporters were and he'd say go to the morgue and spend some time in there and I thought man he's trying to slough me off so, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I like this but I I grew to absolutely love and cherish those moments because you could just at that time I could just go back and read any newspaper I wanted they had them all sorted out in in, in order of year and, uh, you know, it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And uh, my only attachment to the reporter as far as actually working there was, let's see, 1968 or 69, I took papers off the press downstairs to have the big press. They would come and they'd be a little blank piece of paper that would kind of earmark, I think it was 50, can't remember that. And then I would I would run over, put it on a, a, a little tape, and uh, somehow this was wrapped up. I think it was, it was an automatic thing. I'm not sure. I think it may have been a nylon uh, tie or whatever it was, you know, at the time. But uh, yeah, I, I I do have memories, mm -hmm. you know, although I wasn't really working. I, I, and I'm afraid of the the danger of. Uh, you know, today's atmosphere of the, uh, the, the politics going on. Because back in those days, there was like a safety check on facts that were written. If you made a spelling error, it was dealt with, right? <laughs> uh, like, and quick, you know. And uh, so you had to be accurate in your reporting. If not, there would be consequences. And today, with online stuff, there's no consequence. You know? use fiction or whatever imagination or whatever our motives are to create a reality of it, right? yeah. for many people that is their reality and they're looking at it without question yeah. and, and that's really scary to me you know well you're wrapping this up on a really scary note thank you for the <laughs> thank you for the thoughts uh, and i want to ask before you give the you, microphone away do you remember how the papers were warm when they came off the press you know, I always remember that they were felt like just out of the oven. Yeah. It was yeah. so weird. I remember yeah. it was hot working down there too. Yeah, it was they, always hot. They, yeah. They melted the, the, the lead for the uh, the actual pipe. Yeah. Didn't they melt some of that there? Early. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what's going on out there. <laughs> but, anyway, uh, thank you for the opportunity, Kevin. Thanks. Okay. For Thanks very much. Just cover the mic for a second for me, okay? So right now, I would like to say, Thank you very much for joining me tonight. I don't know if I had any questions online or not. Were there any? Okay. Right now it's coming up on eight o'clock. I've been my hour of time. 
I wish to thank you all very much for sharing your memories tonight and write your city councilor about archives funding. Be the best friend for Dan. He's a cool guy. Thank you.